Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome back to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. This is Jeff Lerner, your host, always ecstatic to get to be here with you and to get to have amazing conversations with really successful and usually very cool people. Um, and the fact that I get to do this and it's even considered work is, is almost silly and certainly a, a lot of fun. And today's no exception to that. In fact, today's a little extra special to me because we have as a guest, Adam Ivey, who has, uh, like myself, has transitioned from being a musician or being in the world of music into and adding digital marketing to his repertoire. And unlike me, he's actually kept, stayed with a foot in both camps and he's now combining music and digital marketing. Super cool and I'm really excited to, to talk to him about that. Uh, if you don't know Adam, he's a music producer, professional YouTuber, has a, a big YouTube channel with a few hundred thousand subscribers, award-winning creative marketing specialist, the founder of, and I'm pretty sure I'm saying this right, Just Be Apparel, and uh, it sounds like he's a lifetime entrepreneur who started his first business in third grade uh, selling <laughs> snack bars. And he's just continued to climb the ladder ever since. Uh, Adam, welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Thanks so much for being here. No, I appreciate the opportunity, Jeff. It feels good to be here. And yes, you were correct with Just Be. It's, it's an apparel brand that uh, apparently I need to write out of my bio because I, I did that for a couple of years a while back. <laughs> but I um, realized that the t-shirt business was not... For me, but uh, yeah, it's still a passion project. And I have about 15 grand of inventory sitting in my garage. If you want a free t-shirt, let me yeah, know. Yeah, I, I, I'm not above a free t-shirt. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, man. Um, yeah, well, so, so I mean, I guess sh I don't, you shouldn't tell anyone this, but are you saying that as an entrepreneur, not everything you do actually works out? Everything I do works out. It's just right, a right. lot level. I'm just kidding. Totally yeah, of kidding. Course, of no, course. I mean, over the years, I'm in my mid thirties now, I'm 35. Um, I've had bunch of different businesses. I had a media agency where it was just me sitting in my spare bedroom, you know, creating WordPress, uh, you know, WordPress um, websites for people and graphic design and all that stuff. And that got boring, wasn't worth the time that I was spending into it. And then I did an apparel company for a couple of years. Uh, I mean, so many different things over the years. And then you try to kind of as you mature into an adult, figure out who you are, figure out where your passions lie, figure out something that you can just sustain doing without hitting boredom or, or burnout and uh right. yeah music and marketing have always been there for me yeah it's it's funny everybody when they start out starting businesses or kind of venturing into entrepreneurship everybody's so worried about just turning a profit that it, it, they don't realize until later that there's these whole other range of like qualitative considerations like will this still be fun in 5 years and are you stimulated and fulfilled by the day-to-day -day grind and do you feel like you're making an impact and adding massive value to the world? And, you know, the nice thing about entrepreneurship is uh, you can do a lot more with it than just make a lot of money. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that if you go into it just looking to make a lot of money, you never will. Yeah. Um, Amen. You know, the, the apparel company to touch on for like two seconds, you know, I started it in two, uh, 2016 out of ego. I'm like, I'm really good at marketing. All these companies are paying me boatloads of money to do little three month, six month marketing contracts, and I'm making six figures with my, my music. Why not start a, an athletic apparel company? And none of my audience, aside from a few you know scavengers here and there, were uh, fitness minded people. Um, and I got myself into about fifty thousand dollars, give or take, worth of credit card debt from loading up with inventory because I reached out to uh, suppliers on Alibaba and they had minimums, and I was learning right. the business and you know, I'll tell you the fifty or sixty thousand dollars that I spent in the, you know, net five or six grand profit that I finally made at the you know finish line when I was like, I need to break even. I need to pay off these credit cards. 
I don't care if I make a dime. I just need to pay off these credit cards. Um, yeah, it, it taught me so much, not, not only about the physical product market, but also what I may or may not be built for, designed for, fulfilled within. So uh, right. yeah, it's, it's a journey. I, I think that entrepreneurship in general is like climbing a ladder that has no top rung. You just have to get really you know, passionate about the climb. So yeah, yeah. And it's not a, it's not a straight ladder either. <laughs> it's like, no, no. It veers right. It veers left. Sometimes it goes back to the ground and then shoots, shoots up again. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's kind of crazy. Um, so you, you said something casually that I'm going to hone in on real quick, which is making six figures with your music. Um, yeah. I was a professional musician for a long time. I, all through my twenties, I played piano professionally sang a little, played a little guitar, you know, whatever I could get, whatever gig to pay the bills. I sure. never made six figures with my music. Okay. I topped out at, and this was including teaching piano lessons. Well, my, ta my highest tax return in my 20s was 42,000. I probably made 50 or 60 if you factor in tips. Sure. But sure. Uh, that, that just right there is a significant achievement, making six figures with your music. And Thank I suspect you. that's because you are a better marketer than, than I was at that time. Um, t tell me a little bit about what that looks like. I mean, I assume that's not, I signed with a record label. They gave me an advance. No. They gave me royalties. You did that on your own. Yeah. I don't think record labels really like me just to put, put it out there okay. because I spend my entire focus in the marketing side of things now empowering music creators to do it without a label. Oh yeah. So you know, I preach the fact that a lot of those labels are trying to manipulate and take advantage of young creators that don't know any better and they'll give them an advance, which they don't explain to them as a loan. And if you don't uh, hit those key performance indicators or whatever, they're going to come back for their money eventually. And you can end up bankrupt after signing a million dollar contract. Right. Um, you know, that's the danger of it. And that's why I, I teach the, the marketing side and the business side, branding side on the music, um, in the music niche. But uh, the first year I ever made six figures with my music online was between 2010, 2011, selling instrumentals um, on a website primarily called SoundClick. SoundClick still exists, but there's a lot of better competitors in my mm -hmm. opinion now. Um, and what that looks like is when you're a music producer and you produce beats, instrumentals, um, you're creating a sound bed for an artist to then get on to write a song, sing over, rap over, uh, what have you. So mm -hmm. the way I was doing it and the way that it still works today is we do leases. So um, one instrumental, one beat, you know, just the music behind a song uh, could go for, let's say, $500 or $1,000 exclusive price. That means that only one person gets it. They have complete exclusive rights. doesn't mean that they get the entire split, but that's a different conversation. But if you're just getting started and you can't afford $500 or you can't afford $1,000, you can lease it. It's kind of like renting. Right. So what you do is you have a limited license. You could still use it legally. The producer is giving you that permission, but the lease might only be 25 or $35 rather than hundreds or, or thousands of dollars. So, you know, that first year making, I made $111,728 in the first year I ever made six figures. Um, and what, what that looked like is about 50 to 75 leases a week, as well as exclusive sales mixed into that. So you, you figure, uh, you know, 50 to 75 times 25 to 35, uh, and then my exclusives typically sell between 500 and 1500 a piece. Um, and yeah, just getting a lot of people to the, the, the music to begin with and then climbing the charts on that particular website to get a lot of visibility uh, with a little bit of paid marketing, a whole lot of hustling and DMing and messaging and emailing mm -hmm. everybody I could get my hands on and YouTube and all that good stuff. Um, I'm not, I would never in a million years say it was easy. It never got easy. It never will be easy, but when you get the systems in place, it's a whole lot less work. Um, and as you do your inbound marketing, as you know, you know, you have a bunch of different content in a million different corners of the internet that people can discover you. And um, I'd say, you know, 40% of my beat selling business year over end came and still comes in a lot of ways from return customers, building yeah. a mailing list of everybody who's ever inquired, everybody who's ever purchased beats. The next thing you know, like today, I don't have a public catalog because if I have two instrumentals every few weeks or even a month, I send it out to 24, 25,000 different people in that email list. And I say, hey, first come, first serve. And usually within two, three days, it's sold. So I don't have to go about you know, marketing a huge pool. I just let them go for the exclusive rights. And it's a little bit less of a headache. Huh. That, that is so cool. Um it's so funny too, man. Like I, you know, I, I have a decent number of musicians in my following because I'm a musician turned, you know, entrepreneur slash marketer. 
And, and I, it's, it's funny, musicians, they're so, it's like the holy grail to be able to just have a decent life and make music and not have yeah. to like make music while you also sell cars or while you also mm -hmm. tend bar, or you're also a server at a restaurant, like just to make music um, and, and be able to have a decent life. How, how, how doable is what you just described for the average guy out there who's got a little home music set up and uh, doesn't really have a plan? Uh, well, without a plan, it's very hard, right? But when you kind of develop the plan and you have a work ethic, whether you're working full time in retail or you are selling cars, if you can crank out enough content, and I'm not trying to sound like music is robotic. I definitely have respect for the purists that just do it for the love of it. Um, but there's a lot of people that do it for, for, the, for the love of it. There's a whole lot less people that actually do it for a living, as you mentioned earlier. So you got you to gotta shift your mindset. As a producer, as a beat maker and instrumentalist, you know, I also write. Um, what you do is you sit down like it's a job. You give yourself a period of time and you crank out enough content to build a portfolio. Once you have a big enough portfolio, even 10 instrumentals, for example, if this is the route that you want to go, mm -hmm. then you have enough to present without somebody going to your page and then getting bored because you have two things. Right. It's like telling people to go to your store at the mall that you're spending $6,000 to rent a a month and then you have like two things on the shelf. They're not going to stick around. Right. So you want to have a big enough selection. And the thing that kind of is very discouraging about that is people would say then like, well, I have, you know, I have 20 or 30 beats and people are only listening to the first few. Well, you got people that are going to go through everything. And those are like the people that are kind of, they're buying into what you're selling. They're buying into your brand and your product. Um, is it easy? Nothing, nothing in, in the realm of music is easy. When I get sync licensing opportunities, I've had music on Naked and Afraid, American Pickers, Bad Girls Club, uh, West Coast uh, Burger King commercial several years ago at this point. Um, none of those were easy. It was all like a ton, ton of networking, ton of yeah. saying yes to things that I didn't know were going to turn into anything. And then eventually it, it kind of falls into place and you build relationships. My first sync licensing uh, opportunity for Bad Girls Club was based on me emailing everybody I could get my hands on on LinkedIn. And then somebody finally felt bad for me and kind of walked me through the ropes. And, uh, you know, I still don't know exactly what I'm doing in every little, you know, nuance. But again, like you said earlier, you got to go for it. If you know enough, you learn as you go, right? The right. definition of an entrepreneur is, the, you know, the guy who builds a plane as he's falling from the sky. So you kind of, you have to figure it out. So um, when it comes to music, though, the great thing about it is you don't just have to sell beats online. I've had sponsorships with Adam Audio, the speakers that you see back here. I've had sponsorships with Dell because they see how I'm presenting different information about the music industry, about music products. They like the way I review. Um, obviously, gigging, even though uh, you know doing gigs live in a lot of states is very difficult right now. I have students. Um, one of my students named Jennifer makes a living doing Twitch streams. She essentially wow. does gigs multiple times a night for three or four hours, no different than if she was playing at a cafe or a bar or something. Um, and she makes thousands of dollars a month. You know, I have a student named Trevor who I just did a video on my YouTube channel. Um, and he went from making a couple hundred dollars a month to now $3,000 in the last two months. So $3,000 to one person might be a sustainable income. It might pay the rent and keep the lights on and people be happy with that. And there's other people that need 10 grand. So right. it all depends on what your vision of freedom is. My vision of freedom is being able to say no to opportunities without my house being taken from me. You know, right. be able to take a day off without feeling guilty about it. You know, that's freedom to me, not necessarily uh, the, the fancy cars or the watches or anything like that. Um, and when it comes to music, you really have to be passionate about it because it's so easy to feel like it's oversaturated. But yeah. they've been feeling like it's oversaturated since beginning of time, since the Beatles, yeah. right? I mean, uh, the medium changes, but the amount of people trying to do it stays the same as far as the ratio to availability, so. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think with music, it, it's, it's really just an important and very universal truth that within really any category of call it a trade, it really doesn't matter if you're talking to a musician. I actually just interviewed a guy earlier today who has an account. Uh, actually, it's a funny story. He, he won the, the BBC, the British version of The Apprentice. Wow. And he was the first guy to, to win that um, who was a tradesman. He owned a plumbing company. And his plumbing awesome. company hit a ceiling yeah. and he, he went on the apprentice and he hooked up with, you know, he, he won. So he got an investment and mentorship from the billionaire. Who's the, like the UK version of Donald Trump, his name's Lord Alan sugar. 
Okay. And uh, he invested in him and he taught him. And um, long story short, he ended up breaking through that ceiling and growing from, you know, growing his plumbing company, made some changes, grew it to like, you know, 150 employees and $10 million plus a year and all this, you know, crazy stuff that's pretty crazy for, quote, a plumber, right? No, 100%. But, But the reason he broke through isn't because he was the best plumber. It's because he hooked up with a guy who taught him good marketing and good business management. It's the same way with musicians. Like I know I spent my twenties gigging seven to nine, sometimes 10 gigs in a week, Mm -hmm. you know, every night plus a Saturday afternoon and a Saturday night and a Sunday church, then a Sunday brunch, then a Sunday night, like week in and week out and weekend. And it's exhausting because I'm doing the trade, but I'm not doing any marketing or business management. Yeah. Right. But, <laughs> but there's always the breakthrough to the ceiling isn't to get better at your trade. It's to learn the marketing and business side of your trade. And that's mm-hmm. kind of what you're teaching, right? Yeah. It's about the, the attention of it. Right. Because I mean, I make the analogy a lot. It's like, uh, imagine how many people have lawnmowers in their garage, but how many people have successful lawn mowing businesses. It's the right. same thing, but it's how you look at it. It's how, what you want to do. It's what you set out to accomplish in it. Um, as a music creator, I mean, look at what you were doing with the gigs. Now, let's take a step back to 15 years ago, YouTube, you know, early days, early days of YouTube. Right. If you would have been that guy who's doing tutorials or doing covers or doing your own original stuff, by now, you'd easily have a six-figure business with lessons, bringing other people in, being a very high in-demand studio musician. Um, the, the possibilities are endless, but it takes that consistency and the focus of, I know that for a while, I'm not going to get attention. I know that for a while, I'm not going to grow or be able to compare myself to anybody that I look up to right now. But over time, if I make the right moves, if I'm smart with how I present my product and present what I'm trying to do to the world, they're going to listen. But it takes, mm-hmm. you know, people, people all the time are like, Adam, I have five or six videos on YouTube. It's just not growing. And I tell them, come back to me when you have 50 videos. Because it, it's, I mean, the, the uh, barrier to entry is very, very low. Right. But nobody's going to take you seriously until they see you put work in on a consistent basis. That's why a lot of people that go viral don't have success afterwards because they, they think they make it and then they fall off with their work ethic. Cause they're like, Oh, I got, I had a video, I had a million views. I'm like, okay, cool. How much money right. did you make with that? Or what did that turn into aside from a couple, you know, uh, podcast interviews or something, you know what I mean? Like it, it, building a real business is, 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 the goal rather than winning the lottery. And so many music creators are out there kind of trying to win the lottery with getting discovered or yeah. the record label just magically going to, you know, put them on and it doesn't work like that. Yeah. I'm trying to look up. I don't think I can look it up while we're talking. I can't multitask well enough, but I mean, I've got a YouTube channel, obviously completely different uh, category. You know, I, I do entrepreneurial education, although I do have a couple of videos on there playing the piano, um, nice. but a uh, different category, but same dynamic. You know, I know a lot of people that are uh, entrepreneurs or marketers that are, and that's a very lucrative category on YouTube if you can get traction, right? Doing tutorials on how to do marketing stuff. And um, yeah, same thing, man. They're just like, they're like, I I made 10 videos, 20 videos. It's not catching. And I'm like, I've had this, I've been doing this for two years. I think I'm over 400 videos. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm growing. I mean, it's great. I get 70 or 80 new subscribers a day, which I actually think is pretty good. Yeah, um, but solid. it's, it's the vault, you know, I'm up to all between 13 and 14,000 subs now, as I'm saying this. Um, and it's cool. Like it's finally at the point now, like YouTube's not my main business, right? I have a, right. you know, other ventures, but even if YouTube was my main venture, you know, this month I'll probably do about four grand in ad revenue from YouTube. So what is, what is it that you could work on what, for two years, let's say I put in 10, 15 hours a week on my YouTube videos. And in two years, you have a completely passive income of 50 grand a year. But there's far, actually not that many things you could do that would give you that result, right? No, really, 100%. Yeah. I mean, the, the opportunity is there, but you have to look at it like that rather than the people that put out things and expect to have some, they're, they're entitled with some crazy uh, hallucination of some return that they are deserving of or something it's like no you gotta put in the work yeah and it's and it's that consistency man and and i love musicians i was a musician i love musicians 
but I definitely caught when you said that you wanted to launch uh, athletic apparel and you're like, but my audience isn't really, and if it, let's face it, what you were really saying is there's a, the majority of musicians are not workout like gym rats, super into fitness, super into working out. There, certainly there are some, uh, oh, sure. I was one when I did that, but a lot of creatives, a lot of artistic types, they put so much into the creative process that they, it's like they, they think there's going to be a reciprocity of the way the, the creation is valued. They put so much into it, therefore, the market should have so much appreciation for it. Mm -hmm. ain't, that just ain't how it works. And, and a lot of musicians are not daily, disciplined, long-form, consistent in multiple aspects of their life. Usually, my, my experience of musicians, and I was one, is that they're really obsessive about their music. And other parts of their life, they're like, whatever, just, I don't care. I just want to do my music, you know? Yeah. So it's not like I'm taking care of my fitness. I'm taking care of my music. I'm taking care of my business. I'm taking care of my marketing. I'm taking care of my dogs. I'm taking care of my family. I'm taking care of my relationships. I'm taking, I also trade stocks. I also like, no, usually they're just like music all in one thing focus, which is right. great. And it's intrinsic yeah. to that creativity, but it's bad business. Yeah, it's only 30% of the equation. I mean, give or take. Yeah. I mean, the marketing and the business behind it, again, there's a lot of people that are purists about their music and they, every single song, every single record, every single project that they're working on is their baby. Right. They are so blood, sweat, and tears into it that they don't understand the business behind it. It's like if you were to make cuckoo clocks, right? A lot of work, a lot of intricate parts, a right, lot of right. craftsmanship over the years. But a very, 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 very expensive cuckoo clock is only like 10 or 20 grand, right? Right, right. So, and, and that takes, ye not maybe not years, but like months and days to, to put together and it's intricate and it's, but people put these digital things together the same way and they want like one song to sell for 10 grand just to like one person or, I mean, there's even people out there that are legitimately serious when they say that they should be making $1 per stream on Spotify, for example, because right. they don't understand the economy. They have no um, grasp of economics or capitalism or like how that actually works when there's 4,000 employees working for a company um, that runs off of yeah, memberships and, and ad revenue. So I yeah, mean, and when, you're, the, um, and when and, your average customer is paying, what, $19 a month and they're listening to 1,500 streams a month. Yeah. You can't do a dollar per stream because they're only earning like two cents per stream or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, the business side of things, I'm very, um, when it comes to just my views in life, I'm, I'm very, I'm like more conservative fiscally, but when it comes to human rights, I'm way more liberal. So like, I, I understand both sides. I'm kind of politically agnostic, as, as my buddy uh, Ruslan says, but it's like the, we need to be, we need to be blessed with all this money for our art in the music industry, in the music community rather, right. versus these labels trying to stay in business because the money's not how it used to be. And they're trying to kind of navigate it. We're trying to find a happy media. So yeah. I think that the best way of doing this is by empowering ourselves into getting that buzz, getting that attention, because then we don't have to worry about a label taking off with all of our money. We don't have to worry about, you know, just depending on streaming income. And so what I try to do with, with my mission is to help people understand, Hey, you are powerful. These decisions and these structurings, within your business are not that difficult. You just have to look at it from an outside perspective of, look, I don't make music 24 seven. I can't look at my music the same way as when I'm not making it is the same way as when I'm making it. Right. So we have all these products and either you want to grow an audience, either you want to get paid, either you want to be able to feed your family and go to Bali and do some extravagant stuff, or there's people that would be just fine with them. One bedroom apartment that just make do and, you know, fiddle along on a, on a computer or I'm sorry, on a well computer for the most part, but right. on a guitar or something and doing lessons. So there's a huge broad spectrum as far as what's possible, you know, for every one Ed Sheeran, there's a million people out there making 50 grand a year doing gigs and, you know, selling merch online and stuff. So um, you kind of got to figure out what you want to go for. And, and, you know, we as entrepreneurs and as, you know, marketing educators try to reverse engineer that and dissect how to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. think it's, uh, I think it's really, it's really instructive for, to, and this is what I wish I had understood when I was a musician, is that you have to treat your career itself 
as its own creation. Yeah. And, and just the way you write a piece of music, you have, and, and you, you, you think about, you scrutinize every note and move it all around and what chord and what harmony and all that. You actually have to look at your career in that same way. Yes. And, and be like, is this, le- you know, begin with the end in mind, right? Is this leading to that cadence that I'm trying to build to? Only it's a career arc, not yeah. a, a melodic arc, right? And um, I think I'll, go, sorry, ahead. go ahead. I was just saying, what, with what you're saying, it is, it's all about the big picture. Yeah. Some people are so focused on that one thing. And, and I'm sorry for interrupting. I get it from my mom. So go ahead, Jeff. I'm, I apologize. No, no, by all means. It's, this, is, this is your interview, man. I, we're, we're here to listen to you. Um, <laughs> no, I want to interview you now. I'm glad that you can join me, guys. Adam Ivey here uh, with uh, Jeff Lerner. No, I'm, grateful, um, I'm grateful to be here. <laughs> yeah, no, it feels good. feels good to have you on. Um, I think that one thing we, we overlook is where we value things. We're selectively upset about injustices, right? People will be super upset that Spotify isn't paying them per stream for their music, and yet they're not upset at all that Instagram's not paying them for the six posts they're posting a week. Mm-hmm. Yet they're, they're, they're having their friend with their $1,500 camera take photos of them and then spending time in Photoshop and then writing up a caption and then doing a video and then editing that or sending it off. They're not mad that they're not getting paid for those views and those likes and those comments. They're only mad about streams, but if you ask me, 3,000 likes on something is no different than 3,000 streams because it's still art. It's still a digital medium, right? So we have to look at everything and how it builds the greater picture because if you're not upset about Instagram not paying you for your hard work, how are you upset that Spotify or even if you go out to a bar and they don't, they don't pay you anything or they tell you that they're going to pay you, you know, $100 plus half of the door or whatever if you have a little right. bit of a name. And the next thing you know, they're like, oh, we didn't and do very well tonight. Sorry, I'm just, we're just going to give you your hundred. We're not splitting bar. Like you can take it as, Hey, I made a hundred. Hey, I got a little bit of exposure. Hey, I connected with five or six people. Or you could say, I'm never going to play there again. I'm going to talk smack about them on Yelp. I'm going to do this. And that's what people do with Spotify. That's what people do when they feel slighted. And don't get me wrong. I understand what it's like to be frustrated. I understand what it's like to be slighted. I understand as, as every entrepreneur does, how many people say, I'm going to pay you next Friday. And that invoice never gets paid. Yeah. You know, so we, we go out, we spend all this energy. And, and I think that artists and creators in the, in the music space, especially we have very fragile egos. So I think a lot of that outrage and the disappointment of lack of money goes into our own self-worth and we start viewing our music is not worthy or our music is not appreciated. Um, because we want everybody to love it. We want to be able to just be an instant success and we want to be the next uh, Drake or something, you know, and um, it's hard. It's any, any creative venture, any entrepreneurial venture. My little brother, Michael has a lawn mowing and um, my little brother, Michael has a business called Mike's mowing snow. It's what it is. He does landscaping in the summers and in the winters in Wisconsin, he has a plow on his truck. That's what he does. He has one employee now. um, And it's hard because he still works a day job. So what I'm getting at is in order to build an empire, in order to have employees, in order to lead with value in other people's lives and in an impactful way that's putting a roof over their heads, it's a whole lot of schlepping around trying to figure out, you know, is this worth it? You know, uh, how, how, how much runway you have in your own energy reserves to, to make it through the darkness. And so music, marketing, YouTube, we could talk about any industry, fitness, we're both, yeah. you know, into working out and stuff. Um, you don't get buff with one protein shake and two workouts, no different right. than you don't get skinny with one salad in a, in a half an hour on the treadmill. Same goes for a career in music or anything else for that matter. Yeah, and I think that's true. Uh, a really important thing for everyone who is venturing into the, the do-it-yourself realm, like the create your own value realm. I mean, as a musician, you're creating what, something you, you want to be valuable in the market. As a marketer, it's perhaps a little more quantifiable the value in the market. But you know, the point is you're creating value, but anybody that steps into that realm, which I believe is where all the opportunity is. Like, I, I mean, maybe I'm biased because I have an entrepreneurial education company, but like, I think for somebody to retire comfortably and securely in the world we live in now with how chaotic it is and where it's headed, um, a job is not a, is not a strong bet for a, for a really like great outcome long-term. I think the do-it-yourself value creator world is where the opportunity is but anybody that's stepping into that world has to understand what you said about the runway of your own personal energy um and that you know what a lot of musicians do 
it, in, and again, I'm speaking from my experience, which was uh, admittedly limited because I haven't been a professional for over 10 years, but I had a solid decade in those trenches. And what a lot of musicians do is they don't pace themselves. Yeah. They go balls to the wall, create, create, create. You know, there's all this romance around, you know, like how Bon Iver went off into the woods and wrote his album in two weeks and, you know, to get, to get over his girlfriend's breakup. Like those, this sort of apocryphal stories and lore in the musician industry, it's like super unsexy to be like, oh, well, you know, what that guy did was he played three gigs a week, but he also spent 20 hours a week on the phone doing networking. He also spent 10 hours a week sending out demo tapes. He also spent 10 hours a week in online forums doing networking. He also spent five hours a week listing his, his instrumentals on sites for sale. He also, like, nobody ever tells that story in the music no. industry like it's so sexy and cool, but the reality is that's the success story in the music industry. Yes, the music industry is in the market of trying to make everything sexy and romanticize every success story into making it seem like, this A and R discovered this person, and their right. life is perfect. And you know that's that's one way the music industry kind of uh, intentionally keeps its creators blind to how they yeah. can do it themselves. They obfuscate and, what yeah. the real pathway for doing it yourself, so that you reach, so that you buy into this illusion that you're just totally waiting for for them to give you their big break, your big break. So then when they yeah. when it quote happens, you'll take whatever you can get. Yeah, and in the reality of things, I mean, even from my DMs and emails, I'm not going to name any names, but there's a ton of A and Rs and labels that have no freaking idea what they're doing. They they watch what what was working two three years ago. They don't stay on top of trends. They hire people that went viral, and they have no idea how they went viral. Right. Um, and then they'll hire a one hit wonder as the new A and R, the new vice president of X, you know, uh, radio station or not radio station, uh, record label. They gave this guy a horrible deal, and now they're putting him in charge of giving other people deals. <laughs> it's like, okay, it's like the blind leading the blind in some respects. Not all record labels. Those of you who are watching that are part of good record labels, thank you for your dedication to the industry and the evolution of it. So, so take me back then. Um, how, how did this evolve? Because uh, I've been into, friends with enough musicians who didn't evolve into marketing. How is it yeah. that you did and, and got you where, where you are doing what you're doing? I have a very a very crazy story. I'm gonna make it as quick as possible. Started producing music in 2006. 2011 comes around. I'm making a little bit of money with my music. I'm hustling, doing a bunch of graphic design jobs. And out of boredom, uh, quite frankly, I came up with a parody idea. As I was driving to the gym, I heard Wiz Khalifa's Black and Yellow. And then a, a McDonald's commercial came on immediately after. And in like 10 minutes, I wrote Red and Yellow, which is all as a parody about McDonald's on mm -hmm. that same beat. Put that up. Um, right around the Super Bowl, February of 2011. Next thing you know, it goes viral between my channel and uh, the guy who directed the music videos channel. Um, that was my barter with them. Hey, I don't have any money, but you can put it on your channel if you want. Did 4 million views in, in less than a month or like six weeks, not even. Um, back then, that was huge numbers on YouTube. It right. was played on a bunch of nationally syndicated radio shows, um, uh, you know, featured on ESPN, G4 TV, uh, MSNBC as well. And I, I had these interviews with these, these radio shows. And the next thing you know, I'm getting emails. I'm getting a lot of messages on Facebook back then and Twitter um, from headhunters, from uh, HR and PR people wanting me to be a consultant because I was like the viral kid, right? They were like, how do we want to do that with our company? And so kind of unexpectedly, I ended up you know, doing some consultancies and I'd show up with a polo shirt. I'm this white little skinny kid. I'm like, hi, I'm the, I'm the hip hop parody guy. <laughs> and then I had, I had really deep ideas about how to do these things that stuck and made it a big enough impression, first impression, uh, for that to just spin off into creative consultancy, uh, brand uh, strategist. I mean, everything from media director, marketing director for um, large companies, small companies, solopreneurs. Uh, I worked in the tech space, the government contracting space. Um, and like I said earlier, it's just like they offer X amount for three months working from home, 20 hours a week. It's like, okay, I can still manage music and do that. It's probably part-time. You show up to a Zoom meeting once in a while in shorts and a button-up shirt and uh, you know, you're know you good to go. And, and just luckily, the ideas and the strategies and the teams that I was able to work with in that space, the things worked, right? Like things were working um, and I built a reputation. Even to this day, I have tons of headhunters on LinkedIn that are annoyed when I'm like, hey, still not interested. Hey, I'm doing my own thing, still not interested. 
um, it feels good, but I learned a lot just from trial and fire, you know, managing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of email contacts and writing copy and all of these things that I didn't even know what a term was for copywriting. Right. I just knew that I like, so in high school, I was very good at creative writing. That's like one of the only classes I ever got an A in. I would write stories, fantasy, sci-fi stuff, just always writing, you know, fun stories. And that has directly uh, kind of, excuse me, kind of um, tied into my passion for copywriting and persuasive copywriting yeah. and telling stories. And even my YouTube channel, I've done a million different videos. So, um, you know, looking into the same camera for the most part that I used to shoot my YouTube videos on, I've gotten rid of the ums and the ahs and all that stuff, which help deliver my message in the marketing sense as well. So the repetition uh, and saying yes to a lot of opportunities when other people were telling me to say no, they said, Adam, don't work for that company. You're not going to do email marketing. Really? You're going to do uh, media stuff. You're going to edit commercials and do voiceovers for these companies. You're not going to be able to do music. Then I'm like, no, I can do both. They're like both fun. And one thing I found as kind of a happy accident is it really allowed me to, to keep, keep away from burnout because it, when I wasn't doing music, I was doing something else in a whole different realm and then mm -hmm. taking what I learned to put it back into music, figuring out something that worked in music and presenting it to, you know, the owner of this company or, you know, the, the, the veterinarian who hired me to help get a little bit of uh, you know, buzz for his new vet office in you know, North Orlando, I was going to say Oviedo, but you know, the, the opportunities, I've always said yes, and I felt like they were a direct benefit to me in the music space. My whole entire intention from the marketing stuff was just to stack up some money, buy a house, and then just do music. But I, I fell in love with it. And you know, now that I'm doing music full time and I have a marketing education business for the music realm, and I have a platform that allows producers to sell their music online and simplify that process, and I have a mobile app with two other partners that I met while doing the marketing uh, stuff on the corporate side. All of this has just been such an abundance of, of greatness. Not greatness, like I'm not great, but it just, just a lot of great opportunities. And I'm, I'm, I'm forever grateful for uh, saying yes to a lot of things that I probably would have said no to if I was a little bit more naive to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it occurs to me as you're talking that musicians, and, and I want to ask a question related to this, but musicians, sure. um, they tend to visualize making their money by their music selling. Yeah. Like I made music and it sells. And I think the short, the, the limitation of that perspective, I mean, obviously I think every musician would love that to sell a million copies of their song or their record or whatever, sure. but music doesn't have to be what sells music can sell drinks. Yeah. In, in other words, you play at a, you play at a club nobody's buying your music, but your music yeah. is a big part of the commerce because yeah. if, if you do a good job, people buy drinks, right? Music can be used to sell McDonald's or Burger King, right? Music sells, but doesn't always have to be itself that it sells. And when, right. you, when you realize that your job as a musician is to make music that sells something, and your first preference is to make music that sells itself, but it's a very reasonable alternative to say, let me make music that, that helps sell something else. It's, and, and, and so I, that's how I see it. That makes, that, that's a frame that makes the whole thing make a lot of sense. But I also know the term that gets used to describe what I just said, at least it did. And admittedly, I was a jazz musician. So we're like, we're pretty fringe. We're real into the struggle and the, the romance and the, even the poverty is like part of sure, the art sure. sometimes. But like the term for what I just said would be selling out. That gets all applied to it. And, and how much do you bump up against that when you're trying to educate musicians around how to look differently at what they do? Do they say, nah, bro, I'm not, I'm not going to sell out like you did. The thing is, if, if I had a product on a shelf and you went in two days later and uh, you asked me, hey, Adam, how's that product doing? And I said, oh, it's sold out. That's a positive. Right. But in, in the music space, if we do a commercial for Pepsi, oh, we're a sellout. What does that even mean? Right. That is, I think that's a projection from people that are overly purists when it comes to the music stuff. They hate capitalism. They hate the yeah. idea of making money with their music, yet they struggle and feel frustrated that they're not making money with their music. Right. 
So it's a, it's, it's a weird conundrum because you want to be popular, but there's people that don't want to be popular yet. They want to be incredibly monetarily successful. Okay. But it's, it's, it's possible in certain ways. And like, you could be behind the scenes on a lot of this work for movies and TV and nobody would ever recognize you. Right. So like there's a, there's a, there's an opportunity there, but then other people just want to be famous and they don't care about the money. And that's more dangerous than like going after it monetarily. But right. when you say that, I hear it so often. People will say something like, oh, you don't even make music anymore. I'm like, yeah, no, I just, I just built this studio with $50,000 you know, $50, studio with, uh, with, you know, just to look good. This, these keyboards right. don't even work. Right, right. It, it's, it's because either they judge your knowledge off of like some Grammy award that isn't even that important to like 99% of people in the music industry. Right, That's just right. like the top 1% facade of what's going on. Or, you know, they, they think you're struggling. And so where, where, where does your success, where does your success gauge land really? Because there's so many, so many different opportunities to capitalize on your music. And I think it's absolutely silly when people say that, you know, uh, well, I'm not going to do that. You know, I, I want to do music full time. That's, uh, that's this marketing stuff. I hear it all the time. You probably hear it all the time. This marketing stuff. I'm going to spend more time on Instagram and email marketing. If I follow what you're saying, than I do making music. You should. Yeah. Because how much time did it take them to shoot the entire season of Friends and how much time have they spent putting it up on TV now for 20 years? Right. And there's, there's teams behind everything we do, obviously. But as a musicpreneur, that's, that's, not, my, that's not my tagline, but as somebody you know, that's running a music-based business, uh, you have to understand that the business side, the marketing side, it, it, it's important, no different than you can't get mad if you're a video gamer and you want to have a full-time sponsorship doing video games. And you're like, well, I'm just really good. I like playing video games, but I don't have to put them on YouTube. I shouldn't have to tell anybody. People should just know I'm really good at it. It's like, right. Right. good luck with that. You know, my, my dad used to say you can, uh, you could crap in one hand and wish in the other and see which one fills the fastest. You know, these, these lottery mindsets of how it works compared to how it actually works is the toxicity that we live within because people see success stories. People see people renting cars and wearing, you know, I'm not saying everybody, but wearing you know, replica jewelry and stuff right. like that. And they think that's just life. They think that what somebody's wearing at an event, such as the Grammys or Academy Awards or Billboard Awards or whatever is like how they dress every day. No, they're dressed in like Target t-shirts too, for the most right. part. You know, they're, they're a human being that is tired from traveling, tired of doing press junkets, tired of being in the studio. Um, but it's the optimized version of ourselves that we present to the world in a marketing sense and a business sense um, to have our voices heard. You know, life is not, you know, one thing I say all the time is, is you could be a professional butterfly catcher and it's still gonna be a job someday. You're not gonna wanna wake up and get out of bed to go grab your net, wear the same outfit, go through the flower fields and catch more Monarch butterflies. I'm sick of it. I've been doing this for 16 years. You got to pick what you're upset about, right? Right, you, right. I think being present, being present is, is something that's a game changer for a lot of people. You just have to be present and say, what I'm going after, there's no roadmap. What I'm going after is based on my passion. And regardless of where I land, I'm going to give it my all to, to make the most of it. And uh, I'm going to be open-minded to opportunities and, and not listen to the people that are crabs in a bucket trying to sell, tell you that you becoming popular or successful is, is selling out. Yeah. That's absolutely not true whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, the, the musicians that were, that were the most insistent, I mean, that, you know, again, when I was a jazz musician, I mean, they're, they're musicians that like wouldn't even play weddings because they didn't want to take requests. They just wanted to play all, all, the all original music and stuff. And I'm yeah. like, but they were also consistently the most unhappy people, honestly, if I, if I size them up objectively. Um, so, so I would say, yeah, to your point, be careful listening to people that seem fundamentally unhappy, but, are, but also have very strong opinions. Um, the, music, the music industry is, is, not very, uh, is not a smart choice for those who have a victim mentality because no, you, yeah. you can be the most optimistic person and you will be dragged through the mud. You yeah. will be told that you're not good enough. You will be told you're not attractive enough. You will be told that somebody can do it cheaper okay, you really have to just believe in the music and, and know that for every hundred no's, you get one yes. That's good enough. You'll, you'll right, move right. you forward. Yeah. Um, 
So let me ask you this. I mean, you're, you have a YouTube channel, a couple hundred thousand subscribers, uh, over 11 million video views. You consult. Uh, obviously, you had kind of that, that big uh, burst out of the gate with the red, uh, the red and yellow song. Uh, you yeah. consult with people on virality. You work with musicians on self-promotion. Like, you definitely, and you've, you've, you've embodied it with your own work. I mean, growing a big YouTube channel. Like, like what do you tell people who are like, Hey, I don't have a lot of budget. How do I get my thing out to the world? I mean, they're, they're essentially what they're trying to do is manufacture virality because they can't yeah. afford distribution. What, what's your sort of strategy or, or philosophy around that these days? I think that, you know, one thing I, I kind of live by myself is use what you have until what you have pays for what you want. Hmm. Um, and so whether it's a cell phone, whether it's a buddy's, you know, old DSLR camera, whatever you can get your hands on, even libraries, a lot of times they'll have gear that they'll rent you or, or let you use while you're in there and you can make the most of that. But what you need to do is you need to start having your voice heard. You need to start telling your origin story. You need to be able to get out there and connect with others um, and know that the virality thing is just a lottery ticket. It's a scratch off, might happen, but you can't chase that because then you'll forever feel like a failure. After that red and yellow video went viral, I've never had another video go viral to that level again. And I chased that for a long time until in 2016-ish, uh, I said, you know what, I got to stop doing what I think other people want. I need to start doing what I want. And that's when my channel started blowing up after losing about 11,000 subscribers because they didn't like the new marketing and business content. Right, um, right. And I said, that's okay because I need to be able to do content that I won't get burned out, burnt out from, something that I'm passionate about, something that I'm knowledgeable about, and something that I just like connecting and talking shop with other people. I wanted to do a fitness channel, but I said, I don't know. You know, I, I, I do music. I don't know how I can tie fitness and music together. So doing marketing for so many years, I said, you know, there's a lot of tips and tricks uh, and, and strategies that I could share with people to help them move forward. And instead of answering email after email and DM after DM, I could just put a video up and it answers a bunch of people at one right. time. And next thing you know, uh, you know, I have a relatively successful education business with three, three and a half employees. Uh, shout out to Andrew. He's part time. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's here we are, you know, and, and unexpected to me, you know, my own team now helps me get other opportunities in the music space because right. they're in charge of, uh, you know, fielding some of the emails and reaching out to some people now. So like I said, I used what I had until what I had was growing it. So I like what you said, chasing the way you don't actually chase virality. You chase, I guess, authenticity. Like you, The structuring you of a viral video is emotion-based. If you can make somebody overwhelmed with emotion, whether that be happiness, sadness, uh, grief, joy, elation, whatever, like that gives somebody the feeling and the, and the drive to share it. And that's how things go viral. That's why political stuff goes viral. That's why wedding videos go viral. Right. That's why dogs smiling and doing funny stuff goes viral. That's why trick shot videos go viral. It's because it's something that gets you hooked and you want to share it with everybody you know because it made you feel so much like this that you want to be able to inject that emotion into somebody else. Mediocre videos don't go viral. Right. Yeah. So it, I think for musicians then, who I, it, you said something really important. And, and this is, you know, here's the thing. I'm a musician slash entrepreneur. So I'm naturally applying a lot of what you're saying to myself because I am a musician. But I can say for myself, it like – there's almost nothing you've said that doesn't equally apply to both containers, musicians sure. and entrepreneurs. Because frankly, musicians are entrepreneurs. Yeah. Like they're, in fact, the, I'll share this, the original term entrepreneur, there's a few uh, source references for that term, but one of the origin stories of that word is it was a producer of light opera and musical theater in 19th century France. Wow. And the entrepreneur is the person that would go into like the creative, um, I don't know what you'd call them, like kind of the slums of Paris, mm -hmm. where it was, it was the, the artist, where all the artists live, but everybody was poor, right? Like if you've ever seen the movie Moulin Rouge, it's like that yeah. cluster, right? The, sure. the entrepreneurs are the people that would go into those communities, go to those night, you know, those clubs and those night spots and look for talent and go, oh, this, this needs to be seen. This deserves a bigger platform and then they would go into like the commercial district of paris and they would try to convince some rich guy to give them the money 
to go blow up the artist or put on the play or, or create the show or whatever. So the entrepreneur was the originally was literally the person that connected the art to the money. Wow. And so probably no coincidence then that everything you're saying seems to apply equally to both. And so I would say what I'm about to say in summary of what you just said, this is just as true for entrepreneurs as it is for musicians. Cause again, they're one and the same. You don't try to go viral by going viral. You try to go viral or you don't even try to go viral. You go viral by finding a deep emotional center that resonates with other people. And the way to do that, here's, here's the catch for musicians. I would suspect a lot of musicians, they put so much emotion into their music that they think their music is going to resonate with people emotionally. And they're, and they're like, I put my heart and soul into this piece yeah. and surely it's going to make other people feel something so much that they'll want to share it with the world. But the reality is uh, your emotion that went into the music isn't somebody else's experience that comes out of the music, but your story. Yeah. Facts tell, story sell. Your story, you said, tell your origin story. The mm -hmm. backstory behind the music is actually much more likely to hook people emotionally than the music itself. Yeah, where it came from. I, I a, lot of musicians, a lot of musicians are kind of introverted and they, they don't, and, and maybe I'm just overly referencing my own experience in all of this, but like my music was my communication to the world. I didn't want to talk to the world. I just wanted to listen to my music, but that's not enough anymore. No, I mean, there's a reason that like Don't Stop Believing is one of the most recognized uh, songs of our, our generation. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it tells a story. It has a powerful message. I mean, you think of all these different songs over the years uh, that have taken off and the majority of them have a powerful message, but then some of them you reference from a movie that made you feel a certain yeah. sort of way. Dirty Dancing, right at the end, I had the time of my life and like right. all these different totally. things. You can have this emotional trigger of what that makes you feel like. The song itself, Christmas songs, aren't so successful on the radio and they don't play them for three months straight because they're just great songs. I want to hear Ben Crosby again. Right. It's because you think of growing up. You think of what your house smelled like when your parents were letting you go and open presents or what you were like with your first girlfriend out of high school or you know, significant other. You have these memory uh, triggers that, that instantly are drawn from when you hear certain things and they have that sentiment, you know, that, uh, that nostalgia. So if we can create these, you know, what, one of my students recently asked Adam, um, I just sent you three tracks. Which one should I use as my single? And I said, if it can make a girl laugh, cry, or dance, you know, it's a good song. We should use it as a single. So it's it's one of these lessons that if it doesn't make other people move, moved or move, yeah. I guess that would be uh, accurate as well. Um, then then it's not doing its job. It's not hitting. It's falling flat. Mm -hmm. It's so. Um, music has so much emotion to it behind it when we're making it. There's so many songs out there that are incredibly popular and people don't even know what the actual lyrical content is about, right? Uh, because they heard they it on spring people. break when they exactly. were having the most fun they've ever had. 100%. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing. Music's up for interpretation, but the feeling that you get from it should be kind of universally, universally felt. If you can do that, it doesn't need a million dollar music video unless yeah. that million dollar music video is a movie and you can really help push that narrative even well, more. Well, think about that Madonna song, Living on a Prayer. Yeah. Like as soon as you said the video, that like immediately came to mind. When I was a kid, I used to watch that video. I, yeah. I don't even know that I would quote, have a favorite Madonna song because I don't love Madonna, but God, I love right. that video, man. It was like, yeah. it, I could get emotional just thinking about it. Um, and I think that's, that's the key here, like the, the, the takeaway. Because listen, most, you know, I have some musicians in my audience, not all. I have a lot of entrepreneurs in my audience, not all. And they're, I'm sure like me, there's a few that are both. But it doesn't matter. Applying this lesson to whatever you're doing, this is the deep truth. If you want something to catch with, your, with the world, it has to be a story. Now, some songs happen to come out at a time when the story's baked in, right? Like, you know, like, um, like you said, like a spring break dance anthem or something. Like that's just, right, oh, right. it happened to get played or in around. the clubs during spring break. So that's always yeah. gonna be the feeling. But you as an artist or a self-promoter, your job isn't to create 
products or art, it's to create stories. Yes. And sometimes you might just have to tell the story to go with the, the song. Sometimes, you know, to your point, the songs that really catch on because of the story, they're songs where like, don't stop believing. It's really easy to understand the words. Mm -hmm. Steve Perry sings in a way where like, you could listen along and write it down. Some songs, you, you don't know what the hell they're saying. You and only know like bad, three words it on means, the hook, yeah. Yeah, you, it's not bad, but it means you're going to have to do more work to define the associated story with that song because nobody can understand the words. Like this is the stuff you have to think if you really want to catch fire. Yeah. No, you, you, you hit the nail on the head, my friend. I mean, uh, songs, the number one hits are usually ones that are easy to remember. They're super catchy. They get yeah. stuck in your head. And they make you feel a certain sort of way, whether it be empowered you know, I, I know that all of us men, there's some songs out there that just make us feel like total badasses, right? I am the tiger, I, baby. That's right. Yeah. You, you know, you have your gym workout anthems. You have songs that you listen to when you're alone and you just want to feel something. You know, you have mm -hmm. songs that might remind you of your grandparents or uh, a loved one of some sort. And then you have songs that are just kind of mindless mowing the lawn music, right? Right. Like some, uh, I get knocked down, but I get up again yeah. crap, you know? So, yeah. Um, Ch Chumba Wumba? Chumba Wumba. That's right. Yeah. I think 95 ish. It thumping. doesn't matter. Tub Thumping That's right. was the album. Right? <laughs> wow, we're yeah, really man. dating ourselves here, Adam. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting old. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not embarrassed to admit it. Um, well, listen, man, this has been amazing. I, uh, it, by virtue of the fact that we're musicians and marketers, I know for a fact we could talk for like 24 hours straight and, and it would be amazing. Um, yeah. But uh, unfortunately, obviously, we don't have time to do that. And I suspect our listenership would taper off if we tried to do that. Without question. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but anyway, this has been wonderful, man. How can people come learn more about both you personally and also your business? Um, thank you. Um, so go to Instagram, Adam Ivy on Instagram, Adam Ivy on Twitter, but uh, primarily come over to YouTube, yeah. uh, youtube.com slash Adam Ivy. If you go to channelfamily.com, It'll take you right there. Uh, that's what I call my people, my subscribers. Um, and I'm not, I'm not trying to sell you anything. So, you know, come over, uh, connect with me on Instagram, connect with me on YouTube. If I have something that interests you down the line, then cool. But I just want to get to know you. I want to build an audience of uh, like-minded individuals who give, you know, constructive criticism and, and ultimate support to one another. Because um, I'm very introverted myself and doing the majority of my work in a room by myself or with a couple other people. Uh, I really, I really get a lot of fulfillment from hearing success stories and being yeah. able to help where I can. So AdamIvy.com, Adam Ivy everywhere. Just cool. come say hello. Yeah, we'll, we'll splash those links uh, in the description wherever this appears. And I am looking at your YouTube channel right now. I've checked it out before we met and I'm looking at it again. And it's, it's a really valuable YouTube channel. I, and I, Thank you. I've worked really hard for two years to try to build a really valuable YouTube channel. So I know what it takes. And I think this is tremendous and everybody would be well served to uh, check it out. And so, yeah, man, I, you know, the only thing left I have to share, I just want to let the audience know we have, a, we have an, a, a book that I wrote. I call it a book. I, that's probably being generous. It's like 20 pages long. Um, and it's called The Millionaire Shortcut. It's the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new digital economy. If you want to get in on this, and it doesn't matter if you're a musician or a plumber or whatever, get in on this digital economy and all the things it can do for your life. Learn from Adam. Check out that book. You get to go to a millionairesecrets.com forward slash Adam I. And uh, that way we'll know you came from this episode. I just am so grateful, Adam, that you were a guest on this show. It's so nice to connect with a musician slash marketer like myself. Likewise, Jeff, I appreciate the opportunity and I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Everybody who's watching, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks to all of you Millionaire Secrets listeners and viewers out there. We'll see you on the next episode. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you want to learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.